Hey, it's Mike here, and today, what determines coronavirus survival, and do we have any control over it personally? Using awesome new animations by the channel Beautiful Science, we're gonna look at the mechanism of how coronavirus claims its victims. We are also gonna look at why certain individuals, groups of people are more susceptible. And finally, what choices can people make to lower their chance of fatality once they have contracted the disease? For example, what can you do before you're infected so that you'll have the best chance of survival when you walk through that hospital door, being infected, let's hope that doesn't happen, all with a bunch of research cited as usual in the description below. All right, let's get started for a quick, kind of not great update. Looking to Italy, they have now reached a death rate, a case fatality rate of about 8%. Yeah, it's probably lower because they have more cases than they were able to test for, but also it has to do with their medical system being overwhelmed. Italy's death toll is now unfortunately trending toward passing China. They're already at 2,500, China's at like 3,200. But thankfully, China is down to basically zero new cases. They might've had one, I believe. And while I stand by my earlier statements that the flu kills a ton of people and deserves more attention, we're talking 16,000 to 60,000 people a year, Coronavirus is actually 30 to 40 times more lethal if you are to get it. And of course, the coronavirus hasn't spread everywhere that it's going to spread, so we don't know how lethal it will be in the end. Thankfully, again, it is less contagious than the flu, but also forebodingly, if you match Italy and the US starting at about 150 cases, you line up their timeline, and the curve looks almost the same. We are matched for how cases are going up. And this is worrisome, especially because the US is a way larger population. Italy is gonna reach a ceiling, but we can just keep going, 325 million people. And thankfully the US death rate is lower than Italy, but between the complete lack of testing up until this point and just the large scale lack of access to healthcare in the US, it could be a problem. In the best possible passive Nordic attack, a Norwegian university actually recommended that its students in the US return to Norway, citing the US's lack of developed healthcare and transportation infrastructure. It burns like a cold Norwegian frost. Anyway, zooming out, there seems to be widely available information on how to stop the spread of the disease. We're talking about using masks and hand sanitizer and social distancing, but what is less talked about is the question at hand, how to increase your survival if you are infected. And so before we get to the how it kills, let's talk about the who it kills. So what groups have the highest fatality rate? You probably already know that it's older people that are susceptible in general, but it's also just people with pre-existing conditions. And before we get into that, let's look at this chart on age and fatality. Under 50, again, we're averaging about a 0.2% chance of fatality, but then it ramps up all the way up around, you know, one in six people who are 80 or older, which is massive. As for pre-existing conditions from this Chinese study of 45,000 confirmed cases, we're talking about people with heart disease and hypertension and diabetes. And between those people and people over 60, that accounts for over half of the deaths. And in terms of those pre-existing conditions, one third of coronavirus deaths had patients with pre-existing conditions and more about those conditions in detail in a bit. But to understand what might be going on here, let's back up to the basics of how this virus infects people with some collaborative animations by Beautiful Science. Starting with how the virus reproduces. Once the coronavirus enters the lungs, it uses a protein spike to attach to a receptor and deceptively gain entry into the cell, where it tricks the cell into reproducing it and spitting out copies of itself these then enter the world and spread through coughing and the process repeats. All right, now in order to understand survival, obviously we need to know how the virus actually kills. So let's get into that. And first I wanna mention that COVID-19 is the sickness associated with the disease. The virus itself is now referred to as SARS coronavirus 2, SARS meaning severe acute respiratory syndrome. So this is SARS 2.0. And contrary to what you might intuitively wanna think about how the virus kills, it is not the virus attacking some particular tissue and breaking it down until it doesn't work anymore. It's actually your body's immune response through severe pneumonia that can, sorry squeamish people, kind of make you drown within your own lungs. Because in lethal COVID-2019 cases, several things can go wrong with the lungs. Number one, we have that lung wall damage from the virus directly. Number two, we have the fluid from your white blood cells. Number three, you have an inflammatory response deep in the lungs where oxygen enters the bloodstream called the alveoli. This inflammation response is known as a cytokine storm and can prevent oxygen from entering the bloodstream. And number four, all of this damage can make you susceptible to secondary infections, which could also kill you. 
And real quick, I want to mention thanks again to Beautiful Science for those animations. And we have collaborated on his channel as well with a nine ways to optimize your immune system video that definitely covers some gaps in this video. Anyway, moving on. In most cases, it appears to be that cytokine storm that really does the job from this paper. You can see in this image that it's the inflammatory byproducts that are sticking to that wall where gas exchange occurs, which then of course prevents oxygen from entering the bloodstream. All right, now that you have a bit more background, we can look back to that age disparity in survival. And right off the bat, I just wanna say we're lucky that babies and young children appear to be basically resistant to this thing killing them. So far, knock on wood, but it appears from this study at least that in the children that they looked at, none of them ended up developing even pneumonia. And the going theory on that is that their inflammation system is not as overreactive, so they aren't gonna create that cytokine storm that can kind of drown them out. And this definitely doesn't mean that young people shouldn't care. If young people are irresponsible, they could inadvertently end up killing their elders. <coughs> and that's the moment where he realized he killed grandma. Crap. Nobody wants to be that guy who, yeah, looks suspiciously like just me with the hat. Anyway, why are older people so susceptible? The first reason is that their immune system is somewhat degraded and therefore just can't initially attack and kill the virus as well. And then down the line, they are more likely to have an overactive inflammation response. Again, that cytokine storm. So it's a one-two punch. All right, now for what you can change to hopefully improve this situation here, looking at clinical trials and some epidemiology. And first, let's start with inflammation. We can't turn back the sands of time, but can we lower inflammation because in all of the disease cases, the pre-existing conditions, and of course, actually having the virus, lower inflammation is better. Well, it just so turns out that you can do this through dietary changes, looking to this intervention with a vegan diet. The people who were put on a vegan diet had a 30% lowering of inflammation markers, in particular C-reactive protein. And fun stuff, I just took a C-reactive protein test and I will share my shocking results in uh, the next video I come out with, stay tuned. And a couple more points on inflammation. Obviously, it's going to help to increase overall antioxidant intake, but in particular, eating more turmeric in combination with pepper increases that. Looking to those comorbidities, those pre-existing conditions, we can sort of rate them in terms of which ones appear to be the most lethal. This study out of China did the measurements, and Business Insider made a nice chart of it, so I'll use it. People with heart disease had a 10% chance of dying. Diabetes had a 7% chance. Chronic respiratory disease and high blood pressure, both around 6%. Cancer, nearly 6% as well. But if you didn't have one at all, less than 1%. All right, let's go in order, starting with heart disease. I've mentioned this a million times before, but a whole food vegan diet is the only one that has clinically been shown to be able to reverse cardiovascular disease, which includes stroke and heart disease. Looking to Dr. Esselstyn's study of about 200 people, while the study didn't have a control group, the people that stuck with the diet had a 100 times lower rate of heart attack and stroke than those who happen to quit the diet. And they have the imaging to show it most notable here in terms of the timeline of infection we're looking at right now is the massive increase in blood flow that they measured. And that was after just three weeks. And think about this, think about how well your survival is gonna be with the before in terms of having a limited amount of oxygen available from those alveoli versus the after. That after is gonna have a higher survival rate. And not to mention, well, the coronavirus is killing 20 people per hour globally. Cardiovascular disease kills 2,000 people an hour, so 18 million people per year. So reversing our number one killer to prevent coronavirus would also be just, just a little extra plus for you. Next up is diabetes. Let's speed the pace up here a little bit. From the Adventist studies, vegans had a 78% lower total risk of all diabetes, which is pretty amazing. And in addition, there have been some clinical trials like those by Dr. Neil Bernard showing a pretty impressive reversal of diabetes. Next, we have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. I haven't actually talked about this in a video, but about 80 to 90% of it is caused by smoking. So obviously stop smoking, but there's also more from Dr. Greger of nutritionfacts.org. Data dating back 50 years found that high intake of fruits and vegetables was positively associated with pulmonary function, lung function in general. In 2002, we learned that every extra serving of fruit we add to our daily diet may reduce our risk of getting, and then eventually dying, from COPD. In 2007, a pair of studies emerged, one from Columbia, one from Harvard, implicating cured meat as a risk factor for developing COPD. So switching your diet to one higher in fruits and vegetables 
again, a great choice here. And next we have hypertension. Vegans, people on that fully plant-based diet have about 60 to 70% lower hypertension rates, depending on the study that you look at. Next, we have cancer. I don't want to make any major claims here. That's a long-term disease. But at least from this meta-analysis, vegans had 15% lower total risk of cancer. And I do have some other videos going more in depth on cancer, and I'll try and link one below. Finally, I want to mention something about aging because I said we couldn't turn back the sands of time, but it appears that we can reverse genetic aging to a degree. Yes, it appears from Dr. Ornish's heavily plant-based diet trials, you can actually increase the length of those telomeres, which shrink as we age, and those are the caps that protect your DNA. Next, just briefly, there are a few vitamins that can help increase immunity and therefore survival, and those are vitamin D, vitamin C, and zinc. And I just want to say, uh, zinc has a tolerable upper daily limit of 40 milligrams, yet a lot of companies are irresponsibly selling 50 milligram tablets. So when my dad found out about this, he actually took two of those, which was 100 milligrams, felt really crappy, thought he might have the coronavirus, ended up throwing up. So just, just don't go over 40, please. <laughs> and a final thing here, I just have to say to update on my last video, which was, is the coronavirus actually saving lives? I feel super validated because multiple experts have actually come forward and said the same thing. In particular, one did an analysis that found that from air pollution alone, it could have saved 70,000 lives in China. Obviously, I don't and they don't think that it's a good thing. It's just an observation worth making and they didn't even go into traffic deaths. All that being said, we can still have major failures to contain the virus, perhaps maybe by withholding nationwide testing due to political motivations or just being really irresponsible and thinking it's not a big deal at all. We can make it not as big of a deal if we work together. In conclusion, in addition to the obvious quitting of smoking, a shift away from eating animals, that habit that caused this whole virus to spread into humans in the first place has some major benefits and could massively increase your chances of survival with this disease. And it's massive because you can pretty reliably improve or completely reverse many of these pre-existing conditions that are responsible for death in these coronavirus cases. You can also lower that inflammation that is what kills people in this situation reliably again. Again, I will link to Beautiful Science's channel at the end and down below so you can check out that collab video, which is gonna cover a lot of tips on how to prevent yourself from getting infected in the first place, which this video doesn't cover. So check it out and let me know what you thought down below. Is there anything that I left out? I probably left out some stuff. I really wish I could have covered more in this video, but every video has a limit. All right, thanks for watching. Feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one.